Yes, this is what I am. This is what I have been as long as I've known myself. A solitary person waiting behind a window. Here in the cardboard box of my manuscript, I have dumped a heap of jigsaw puzzle pieces, each one in itself incomprehensible, each one falling face up or face down onto the others, scattering across the vast field of play. Out of these pieces, the long fingers of the logic of dreams could, through meticulous maneuvers of combination, rotation, positioning, augmentation, and diminution, centralization, and lateralization, highlighting and blurring, arrive at a partially coherent picture, at least coherent for me, while for everyone else it would remain absurd, because there are both intelligible and unintelligible coherences, just as there are comprehensible and incomprehensible absurdities. You can understand the intelligible, and this is calm. You can understand the unintelligible, and this is power. You cannot understand the intelligible, and this is terror. You cannot understand the unintelligible, and this is enlightenment. As in the deepest darkness, you can no longer tell your eyes are open or closed. Sometimes I feel that in the midst of my life's fears and tremors, I do not know on which side of my brain I am. Hey everybody, thank you so much for continuing to watch Leaf by Leaf, and to those of you who are new to Leaf by Leaf, today is a great day to watch this video. And I know that sounds bombastic and maybe a little self-involved or something, but the reason is because I am so excited about the book that I'm about to talk about, and I'm going to get crazy today. Leaf by Leaf is going to be crazy today. I'm going to make outlandish, audacious claims about Solenoid by Mircea Cartarescu, translated notably by the great Sean Cotter. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. For me, of all the 21st century novels I've read so far, this is the greatest. Of course, you may have seen my previous video on another collaboration between Cartarescu and Sean Cotter that is with Blinding, the left wing of the trilogy from Mircea Cartarescu from Archipelago Books. Well, again, they've teamed up and Deep Vellum got involved to bring this one out. And I didn't think that Blinding could be topped even though I had lots of people who had already read Solenoid in the original Romanian or in the early Italian translation telling me, listen, believe it or not, Solenoid is even better than Blinding. Yes, you were right. I agree. And for those of you who haven't read it, you can't spoil a book like this. There's one thing at the end that could be seen as a spoiler, I suppose, and I will hold off on that but you can watch this whole video without having read the book, or at least watch it until your appetite has been whetted enough to go and get it. But I'm, I'm just gonna have to implore everyone to read this book over and over. This is a beautiful, mind-bending, emotion-shattering hymn to literature. And again, because it is a translation by Sean Cotter, I consider this two works of art in one. So you've got the work of art that Cotter has incredibly pulled off here. And you've got the shadow of the great master, that is Mircea Cartarescu, who put this out there. It's, it's This is just a, a stunning testament to the power of the written word. The way this video is going to go, I'm going to make some general observations about Solenoid. And then for context, I'm going to attempt a sort of plot so that we can take that with us into the rest of the video. Then I will start to dig into the different characters and the setting and the themes and the ideas of the novel with heavy excerpts. And then we're going to end the video with an extended highlight reel. And I will literally go through and read my favorite passages. And then throughout the whole video, of course, I'll have my 
freestyle commentary like I normally do. So let's get to it. This is going to be fun. I read Blinding in early 2021 and went wild for it. Someone told me that Sean Cotter referred to me as some guy on the internet who sounded like he was about to pass out talking about the book. Indeed, reading Blinding or Solenoid is to face the danger of reader hyperventilation. Shortly after posting the video, Deep Vellum generously sent me Cotter's translation of Femme by Magda Carnecci, another of his Romanian translations. Reading that one prompted a feverish review that I wrote in one sitting. And then of all places, Kenyan Review accepted it for publication. I was thrilled. I've been wanting to get something published in that great journal for over a decade. So to say I've been looking forward to Solenoid is a vast understatement. Yet when it was finally in my hands late last year, it felt so sacred. I felt a reserve about jumping into it. I needed to behold its exterior and feel its presence for a while. When I finally did read it, it took longer than I had expected, and I finished it the night before leaving for St. Kitts for a week of vacation. But this was actually fortunate in hindsight because it allowed me to contemplate the book at a physical distance and among breathtaking views of islands and oceans and skies before returning home to add some structure and cohesion to my thoughts in preparation for this video. And there are many thoughts that I have on this book. Solenoid has that stature of a career ending laurel or capstone in which a master artist can finally say that they've captured and expressed everything they've spent their life seeking. So I feel an acute sense of despair trying to make this video. When someone achieves this level of artistry, Mircea Cartarescu and Sean Carter, it feels almost diminishing or damaging to try to speak of it at all. What could I possibly say about a book that says everything and says it better than anyone? Nonetheless, these videos, for me, have become the apex of my experience of a book, the final form of my praise and appreciation as a grateful reader. So what is Solenoid about? Is there a plot to this fine surrealist novel? Well, yes, there is. A disillusioned school teacher in Bucharest, which is referred to as the saddest city on the face of the earth, encounters an image in Kafka's diaries that awakens the dormant writer within him. Solenoid is compiled of four parts, corresponding to the four journals that the school teacher fills. Operating as what we could call Mercia in the manner of Marcel from Proust's great epic. Mercia recalls his childhood experiences in a preventorium for children with tuberculosis. He recalls his horror and humiliation at a writer's workshop when his work, which he believes sublime beyond question, is eviscerated by his classmates and his teacher. He recounts his days of reading and writing, his relationships. He tells of the toil of his days trying to teach youthful Romanian and Gypsy children who had no respect for him and lived secret lives. He explores his infinite house that resembles a hypercube. And finally, he surveys every facet of his own life. Memories, desires, hopes, dreams, hallucinations, old diaries, whatever he can find to derive some meaning. This earnest search through every form of matter that constitutes Mircea's reality is driven by a handful of talismans. Old, stiff bits of thread he pulls from his belly button, vestiges of a barbaric method of cutting and tying off the umbilical cord. His baby teeth in a tic-tac container on his bedside drawer. The Gadfly by Ethel Lillian Voynich, which he read as a youth. And the image of Issachar and Hermana from Kafka's diaries, which he reads later in life. These nodes construct not only a metaphysical timeline of his life, but they materialize and resolve into a mental tesseract that provides an escape vessel for Mircea in the form of his journals, which we now have as this novel. He is a prisoner of the walls of his skull, but he needs to find the ultimate question of life and thereby make the ultimate decision. In the end, what we have here is Cartarescu's Book of Revelation, written in his Tradition of One that I will call Ecstatic Maximalism. 
and interpreted for us by his co-prophet, Sean Cotter. You know, the literary landscape is, of course, congested with different articulations on memory, dreams, and time fame and misfortune, dreams deferred and revelations incurred. But Cartarescu in Solenoid has contrived a new idiom with which to speak of these things, and maybe the apex of all such idioms. While it is certainly true that little books can create incredible conflagrations, in the hands of a writer like Cartarescu, in the big books, he has the space to take time to lay more sticks of dynamite and thereby create incontestably greater pyrotechnics. This is a Kunstler Roman, that is a coming of age of an artist, or perhaps an anti Kunstler Roman, the anti novel par excellence, that takes a cue from an image in Kafka's diaries to capture the feverish intensity of an aspiring writer, the deadly blow of a failed dream, and the ultimate dilemma of what's here called saving the child or the art. There is an abundance of fantastic interior spaces in Solenoid, but I don't think any of the spaces is as intriguing as the interior of Cartarescu's mind. In fact, all of the other interiorities in this book may well be seen as projections of or synecdoches of Cartarescu's mind. Like I said, with this book, Cartarescu attempts to build a tesseract out of words through which we all can, for the first time ever, stand outside of our three-dimensional cage and examine our own human consciousness. Solenoid is, of course, a work of surrealism. And in fact, there's a blurb on the back of this book from Andre of the Untranslated, who calls it the best surrealist novel ever written. Yet it remains tethered to a quest plot that somehow reconciles or superpositions, maybe entangles plot and anti-plot, genre and anti-genre, convention and anti-convention. Cartarescu is not trying to obscure anything in this book. This isn't an allusive or cryptic text. It is a referential and explicit text. Solenoid brings the Proustian search, the obsession with recovering time lost through memory and dreams, into the funhouse of post-postmodernist 21st century literature. In a way, Cartarescu has fulfilled Einstein's unified field theory by connecting and reconciling the infinitesimal and the cosmic into one cohesive framework. And he has fulfilled the novelist's dream of finding a language to do such a feat. The prose is a heady, intoxicating brew of poetry, biology, genetics, anatomy, chemistry, physics, topology, neurology, zoology, hallucinations, dreams, memories, and parasites. Now let's go through and take excerpts from the text to fill in and flesh out this Murcia character a little bit. He says, the army did not make me a man but it did increase my introversion and aloneness. Looking back, I wonder how I survived. 
I never read at a table, but in my bed. That piece of furniture which, aside from the book itself, is the essential part of my reading toolkit. And this may be pretty well off point today, but I couldn't help but picture and think about Michael Silverblatt because this is exactly where Michael Silverblatt did all of his reading. And in fact, when I saw his bedroom back in 2021, you could see where he had spent so much time reading while in bed that the paint and the material of the wall behind where his pillow was to support his head had been completely rubbed bare. Whatever may be said, I love literature. I still love it. It's a vice I can't put down. A vice that will destroy me. You can't defend yourself with the vastness of your knowledge of the world. Your world is not theirs, the school children's. Your authority ends at the classroom door where theirs begins. And there's a lot of this feeling and musing on the youthful energy of the children being so much greater, so much more alluring and powerful than the vast storehouses of knowledge and wisdom of the teachers. They lived in their tiny enclosed world without a past or future, but full of myths and strange rituals. I found that to be such a great description of how adults must view teenagers. There is a strange world with its own myths and rituals that gets constructed by each generation. And so young and old are constantly in this regenerative life cycle where we're made mutual strangers from one another. I was constantly held and, according to my mother's wishes, dressed like a girl in dresses, my hair long and curly, dark blonde at the time. And it struck me that there is a correlation with Rilke here because I believe that Rilke's own mother did the same thing with him, dressed him as a girl. And we'll also find that Rilke is among one of the authors with whom Mircea connects Kafka, Rilke, Hamsun, Borges. I lived inside my skull. My world extends as far as its porous yellow walls, and it consists almost entirely of a floating Bucharest, carved in there like the temples chiseled into the pink cliffs at Petra, stuck like a fibroma to my meninges. At the far edge of my left temporal lobe is Voila. That is where the Preventorium was that he stayed in his childhood when he had tuberculosis. The rest is ghostly speculation, the science of reflection and refraction through translucid media. This is his way of articulating the limits of his geographical world, and it's not unlike Hamlet talking about being bounded by a nutshell. Let's talk about the setting of Bucharest, which again is referred to several times as the saddest city on the face of the earth. Because he is writing journals as an adult looking back into his childhood, he's looking back into communist Romania. And there will be mentions of children reading their party magazines and so on. But there is this factory that has this mystique about it. And it acts as a sort of central nervous system to the whole town. And the teachers are aware that things go on there with the children that they don't know about. It sort of reminded me of the old rendering plant in Wolfgang Hilberg's novel of the same name. Overall, the Romania that Cartarescu depicts in this book gave me a sense of the way that the collectivized farm in Hungary is depicted in Bella Tarr's adaptation of Laszlo Kreshna Horkai's Satin Tango. Mention must be made of this house, this infinite house that resembles a hypercube and is taken straight from the pages of Borges, which also lends its debt to Charles Hinton the creator of the Tesseract and the depictor of hypercubes. From then on, I would be the owner of a house that had been constructed, even if only in the senile imagination of a nonagenarian, that is someone in their 90s, on type of a gigantic coil buried in the earth. And so not only is he in this 
infinite and shape-shifting structure of a house with these endless corridors and rooms, but he also finds that there's this solenoid, and it'll be one of many solenoids, but there's this solenoid that's buried under the house and causes him to be able to do such things as levitate above his bed. Early, early, early in the book, we get that scene of his fall from grace, his humiliation and ultimate rupture for an aspiring writer back at that writing workshop where he read his poem out loud. And I'm going to read this extended passage because Cartorescu does such a great job giving us that feel of the mindset that young aspiring writers have when they've pinned something they know beyond any doubt is the most sublime work ever created, only to then come crashing into that cold water of reality. The Fall, which is what his poem is called, was not a poem, but THE poem, capital T, capital P. It was that unique object through which nothingness is honored. It was the result of 10 years of reading literature. For the past decade, I had forgotten to breathe, cough, vomit, sneeze, ejaculate, see, hear, love, laugh, produce white blood cells, protect myself with antibodies. I had forgotten my hair had to grow and my tongue with its papilla had to taste food. I had forgotten to think about my fate on earth and about finding a wife. Lying in bed like an Etruscan statue over sarcophagus, my sweat staining my sheets yellow, I had read until I was almost blind and almost schizophrenic. My mind had no room left for blue skies mirrored in the springtime pond, nor for the delicate melancholy of snowflakes sticking to the building plastered in calico vecchio. Whenever I opened my mouth, I spoke in quotes from my favorite authors. When I lifted my eyes from the page, in the room steeped in the rosy brown of dusk on Stefan Selmer, I saw the walls clearly tattooed with letters. They were poems on the ceiling, on the mirror, on the leaves of the translucent geraniums vegetating in their pots. I had lines written on my fingers and on the heel of my hand. Poems inked in my pajamas and sheets. Frightened, I went to the bathroom mirror where I could see myself completely. I had poems written with a needle on the whites of my eyes, and poems scrawled over my forehead. My skin was tattooed in minuscule letters, maniacal with illegible handwriting. I was blue from head to toe. I stank of ink the way others stank of tobacco. The fall would be the sponge that sucked up all this ink from the lonely nautilus I was. My poem had seven parts representing the seven stages of life, seven colors, seven metals, seven planets, seven chakras, seven steps and falling from paradise to hell. Since my mind was just a jigsaw puzzle of citations, it was a summation of all that could be known an amalgam of the church fathers and quantum physics, genetics, and topology. It was, in the end, the only poem that would make the universe good for nothing, meaning it would be greater than the universe, that would banish it to the museum, the earth to the museum, like the electric locomotive did to the steam engine. Reality, the elements, galaxies would no longer be needed. The fall, his poem, existed, within which everything flickered and crackled with an eternal flame. This is an expression of that longing for the total novel, the encyclopedia that housed everything we could know that stems back to Pliny. I think of Flaubert's Bouvard et Pécuchet, who try to distill everything they can know, but are constantly deflated. Even after he reads his poem, and there is silence, he thinks, during the break, they took a break after he was done reading, no one came near me. They were probably all in the thrall of the sacred horror of a magisterial work. And to be honest with you, that's how I feel about this book. I am completely in thrall of this sacred horror of such a magisterial work. Nonetheless, he believes that his own canonization of his work would follow. I, the unknown kid who looked like a hair-shirted friar with a rope belt, I would become the hope of world poetry, achieving in a single bound what others needed a lifetime to accomplish. I 
would never have to write another word. So again, you get that aspiration of the writer on several levels here, trying to produce the total work, the final expression of all they have worked towards expressing. But of course, what ends up happening is that after the break, like I said, his work is just torn to shreds. It's eviscerated by the his fellow writers and the teacher. And as we will see, this massive rupture changed everything and led him ultimately to producing the journals and thus producing for us Solenoid. So let's talk about this book as represented by those four journals that Murcia is scribbling in. To write these pages meant only for me in the incredible solitude of my life. If I had wanted to write literature, I would have started 10 years ago. I mean, if I had really wanted to, without the effort of consciousness, the way you want your leg to take a step and it does. You don't have to say, I order you to step. You don't have to think through the complicated process by which your will becomes deed. You just have to believe. To have belief as small as a mustard seed. If you are a writer, you write. Your books come without your knowing how to make them. They come according to your gift, just as your mother is made to give birth. And she really does give birth to a child who grew in her uterus without her mind participating in the complicated origami of her flesh. So it's just incredible writing. If I had been a writer, I would have written fiction. I would have had 10, 15 novels by now without making any more effort than I make to secrete insulin or to send nourishment day by day from one orifice of my di digestive system to another. I, however, at that moment long ago, when my life still could have chosen one of an undefined multitude of directions, ordered my mind to produce fiction and nothing happened. Just as futilely as if I had stared at my finger and shouted, move. And so we're told over and over again that this is not literature, this is not fiction. So you get this nice irony in the fact that it is actually the greatest fiction that I've read so far in the 21st century. And it is extremely artistic. But it goes to show that Mircea Cartorescu himself, he has this unique mode of what could be called literary memoir. He says at one point that this is not, meaning the journals he's writing, are not, thank God, a book, illegible or otherwise. So he even says that it's not a book in general. What he wants to do is what he calls a complete investigation of my interior world, since I can't imagine I would have ever written about anything else. This is why I've had to invent some details to imagine some scenes, to populate the wasteland where I lived with characters and feelings. I had to give birth to my mother in my own image so I wouldn't be an orphan. Today I can't tell my hallucinations from reality, the words I put in their mouths from the clinking porcelain, the translucent facts from the opaque. At one point he says that he was eager to continue my manuscript. So at some point this flips over from journals to a manuscript. In a way, it has become a reality for me, the world where I breathe and think. So again, he's constructing his own consciousness in the form of a tesseract that is the journals collectively. And in fact, it's again, not even seen as a book that someone else will read. He says, I am not writing for someone to read me. I am writing to try to understand what is happening to me what labyrinth I am in, whose test I am subject to, and how I can answer to get out whole. Writing about my past and my anomalies and my translucid life, which reveals a motionless architecture, I try to make out the rules of this game, to distinguish the signs, to put them together and to figure out where they are pointing so I can go in that direction. I started to think about my story, the one that I build layer by layer out of gears, infinitesimal screws, and watchwork springs, without being able to understand either how the mechanism functions or what meaning it has, as though I were below the dial where the clock hours were written, 
living like a mite on a speck of dust lost between colossal wheels and springs, stuck in the fine oil on their surfaces. I perceive the mental pieces moving like heavy planets, but I cannot see the gigantic numbers or the clock hands that shift imperceptibly under the sapphire sky of the lid. They are on the other side of the world, even if I suddenly rose through some miracle from my tangle of weights, wheels, and pinions, even if I emerged onto the surface over the dial, I still wouldn't be able to understand that I lived inside a mechanism that measured time. That one passage right there could almost just stand on its own and be published as the greatest book or maybe the greatest page ever written. Here's a passage to give you a sense of Murch's conception of memory. The oldest images that appeared from time to time in my memory were not precisely memories, but vestiges of an older system of capturing the effluvia of the world, atavistic organs of the mnemonic animal housed in my skull. This is just breathtaking writing. I would play with these mental kidney stones the way you might roll colored marbles in your fingers, for the sake of their pleasurable crystalline clacks. Here's another figuration of memory. They pressed their faces, these mental figures in his memories. They pressed their faces against the thick glass and shouted silently to those outside, these captives of an air bubble in the enigmatic crystal of memory. Of dreams, he says, I dreamed or remembered from an immemorial past, since in the dream state you can access the brain you had as a child, like an enchanted castle in the center of your mind, disaffected, ruined, and covered in cobwebs, transformed into a sanatorium or a rabbit hutch, but keeping its regal architecture and preserving, above all, in the center of its knotted quarters, the forbidden chamber, the place you always wanted to escape into because you can escape nowhere but inward. There are these passages where Murcia puts excerpts from his dream diary and then attempts a sort of psychoanalysis on them. And at first this can seem almost like, dare I say, filler or padding, but it is connected deeply to the plot and the themes that are going on here. And they eventually lead to a sort of epiphany. And at one point, he realizes that things may be going on in this preventorium for the kids with tuberculosis than he really realized. He says that he found out that my body, as may have happened before, was subjected in a subterranean clinic to a manipulation about which I remember nothing, but which my dreams later would reveal in their frightening field of images. I dare to connect my nightmares and visitors and the elliptical phenomena that may accompany them. Coincidentally, the last book of fiction I read was The Passenger and Stella Morris by Cormac McCarthy. And there are stunning parallels between these two books, especially in the realm of topology and quantum mechanics. From his dream diary, he wrote, Faster and faster until it frightened me. The walls fled madly past. I hurtled forward at thousands of meters per second, inside of a scream that grew constantly louder. Cue Edvard Munch. An unbearable light began to burn my brain. A feeling of the supernatural tore me to shreds. The end of the world had come. I screamed twice, as loud as I could. It's exploding, it's exploding. And the entire universe exploded inside my skull like a mushroom cloud, but a million times faster and more intense. So you've got this figure of the nuclear bomb and this sort of event horizon and moving faster than the speed of light. All of these enticing brain benders from physics. And then later he says, a dark charm, a black and destructive magic, a detour through a world for which your brain was not created. One that requires another type of mind and other sensory organs. Quantum physics and quantum computing pervade this book. And sort of like what we discovered in the quantum computing book by Brian Clegg, Murcia is realizing that in order to process 
these quantum materials. He needs to upgrade the hardware of his own body, his own brain, to something that's capable of processing this raw data. Like I mentioned, there is a lot about the fourth dimension in here and hypercubes, Charles Hinton. There's a huge debt to Borges here. There's a debt, of course, to Edward Abbott, uh, the writer of Flatland. And though the concept of higher dimensions is connected deeply with the plot, both the real plot and the surreal plot. It also becomes fodder for some, or not fodder, let's not call it that, it also becomes fuel for some of Cartorescu's just sublime ways of articulating things. The despair you feel is that of one who lives in two dimensions and is trapped inside a square in the middle of an infinite piece of paper. How can you escape this terrifying prison? And there is an extended serialized metaphor of being a prisoner and trying to escape that reconnects again and again across the whole of the 600 some pages of this book. We'll get to that in just a bit. But this here is of course most notable in Abbott's Flatland. But here I've come much too quickly to Hinton and his cubes, to which my anomalies seem in some obscure way to be connected. And it's just brilliant how taking the cubes of Hinton, the art of Borges and Kafka, the solenoid under his infinite house, and the book by Voynich, the gadfly that he read as a youth and was wounded, to use Kafka's phrase, wounded by a scene in that book, how he takes all of these and connects them and gives birth to a dancing star. I often thought that the world, along its three dimensions, is an equally deceiving trompe de l'ille for the infinitely more complex eye of our mind, with its two cerebral hemispheres taking in the world at slightly different angles, such that by combining rational analysis and mystical sensibility, speech and song, happiness and depression, the abject and the sublime, it will make the amazing rosebud of the fourth dimension open before us. With its pearly petals, with its full depth, with its cubic surface, with its hypercubic volume. There were disciples of Charles Hinton's after he published his work about the Tesseract and the hypercubes, who thought that if we could meditate on these, meditate on trying to understand the feel, the structure, the mathematics, the physics of the fourth dimension, that we could achieve a thinking on something more complex than the three dimensions we know and think in today, such that we would get a pink into it, that we would step into it, we'd have this mystical transcendence. Speaking further about Hinton, the name of him who invented the term tesseract, which I had used in poems without knowing the source, just as Dali's Jesus had been hanged, not from a cross, but a three-dimensional illustration of quadridimensional cubes, and that uh, is a very famous painting by Dali was not completely foreign to me, and I spent a few days searching for it, going through my books until I found it in the place I had, in fact, first expected, in Tlon Ukbar Orbis Tertius by Borges. Even so, it was a difficult to find the name I looked for feverishly, as though it were hidden from my eyes in the labyrinth of Borgesian language. But, in the end, I located this passage charged with mystifying erudition. In March of 1941, a handwritten letter from Gunnar Erfjord was discovered in a book by Hinton that had belonged to Herbert Ashe. The envelope was postmarked Oro Preto. The mystery of Talon was fully elucidated by the letter. Thus, the explicit intertextual exchange with Borges' great short story. Through analogy and telescoping, he spent his life in an attempt to surpass the intuitive forms of three-dimensional space the only forms where our mind feels at home, because it was shaped by them and has their form, to compel a three-dimensional brain, focused on the volumes of our world, 
to let its hemispheres diverge, to contemplate aimlessly and dreamily, until the familiar forms melted and suddenly, like an epiphany, opened a portal onto the fantastic dimension immediately above our own, a dimension until then accessible only to saints and to the enlightened. And in parallel or mimetically, this is what Cartorescu is trying to do in this book. The Tesseract, finally, the major creation of Hinton's thought, described for the first time in a new era of thought in 1888, is the mystical mandala of his world and the key he saw looking at the quartz padlock of the fourth dimension, the home of the angels as well as the demons of our mind, a good Pandora's box. The Tesseract, or hypercube, is the trace left by a cube that moves through a fourth dimension perpendicular to our world. The same way a square sliding through the third dimension generates a cube. It is a totally abstract and counterintuitive geometrical figure, a cube with 16 corners, 32 sides, 24 faces, and a hypervolume bordered by eight volumes. We cannot visualize this kind of an object by means of our senses and reason alone because those are the tools of a three-dimensional world created so that an amalgamation of soft organs might survive. It's, it's just incredible, incredible writing. We are worms hanging from our horizontal branch to release ourselves from it perpendicularly toward an unconceivable up. We must be, in the blink of an eye, changed. We must grow wings. A tesseract is an object of contemplation and meditation a vehicle toward the lofty goals for which our mind, born of our much too concrete brain, too sticky, too soft, cracking under its own weight, is searching, feverishly, longingly, forever. A poet dreams at the incandescent peak of the pyramid of knowledge, where geometry and poetry become happily one. The tesseract is above even this point because it is, in comparison with the immortal platonic polyhedrons, what they are to the cardboard or paper polyhedrons in the world of the senses. I looked at him, and through him I saw myself as though with an eye that could see itself. This is starting to appear to be sort of like what happened to the narrator in Borges' The Aleph when he looked into the Aleph. As though a system could completely describe itself from within, as though you could determine suddenly, precisely, the position and speed of a particle that would break Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. As though one of your hands could draw the other, and the other, emerging from the page, draw the first. And certainly he's got that great M.C. Escher drawing in mind. And then we get a description of this glass vessel that is never called this, but I believe to be a Klein bottle. A delicate fruit of trembling glass. What? Just stop right there. Look at a Klein bottle and think about the poetry of Carterescu's mind that can call it a delicate fruit of trembling glass. He goes on, a kind of large translucent pear whose narrow part rose like a throat, then curved and re-entered the rounder part of the pear without touching it, only to then emerge from the lower, wider part, invaginating toward the surface. You could follow the stem of ultramarine glass with your eyes, centimeter by centimeter, and you still wouldn't understand how it re-entered the glass without touching its curve, like the handle of a pitcher that in an unknown way became the pitcher itself. My aim was to discover, even if I had only a slim chance, whether salvation were possible, if the message could pass from one spiral to another. And he's got the arms of the spiral galaxy in mind when he says that, in spite of the tragic differences between worlds on different scales or different dimensions, perceived with other senses, in spite of belonging to different ontological fields, other instincts, other loves, and other morals, other paradises, and other gods. And special mention has to be made of this allegorical fable of God sending Jesus to the world to die for our sins and then bringing him back up into heaven. It, it, he, <laughs> Cartorescu takes the gospel message, the gospel story, and reimagines it as himself becoming a parasite and living in the skin of a human. 
And it's breathtaking. And it is out of everything in this whole book, just that little allegory that he tells. The way he tells it just really exemplifies not only his ability to write some of the most effective and beautiful poetry, but also his incredible imagination and how he can find a perfect balance between imaginative power and poetic delicacy. What this episode also does is it gives us another view of this idea of lowering ourselves to lesser dimensions and seeing what it's what it would be like to do so or the other way because with the gospel story Jesus was lowered a dimension and actually lowered two dimensions in the I think that's called the catabasis when he went down and had the keys to the gates of what we typically interpret as hell but then he ends up ascending all the way back up into the original dimension from which he came and so there's a lot of these parallels going on in here. And again, just this allegory of Mercia becoming a, a parasite and mirroring the gospel story and its strength of conveying another way of viewing what that would be like and that ultimately it would be for salvation is astonishing in this book. Towards the very end, he mentions that before going into the next space, I could see the number that had been covered. It was the unimaginable Alpha raised to the power of Alpha, the number of the divine, the number that included all. So again, we're getting at infinities. We're hinting at Georg Cantor and him using the Aleph or the first letter, the sacred letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet, and using that in place of his infinities he discovered that have different cardinalities. And uh, this is amazing. He says, <laughs> he leads up and says that we are children of the cosmos living for a nanosecond on a speck of dust in the infinite depths of the night. Let's take a step back now and look at the abundance of material in solenoid that has to do with reading and books. And of course, as a bookworm, I'm always interested in passages, thoughts, articulations about reading and books and the literary life. I was especially interested in books about people as alone as I was, with whom I could have, finally, an actual dialogue. And I too see reading my books as having dialogues. The Notebooks of Malta Lorids Brigge, Alone by Strindberg, or as my Swedish friends corrected me to say, something like Strindberg, Hunger by Hamsun. These, uh, in addition to Borges and Kafka, are the books that nourish him. He says that reading in my room until I didn't know if it was night or day, I would only turn on the light when I couldn't make out the letters at all. It's just those beautiful days of reading that Proust talked about and that I talked about recently in my third, fourth episode in the Why We Read Fiction series. In addition to the gadfly, he says that I made an amazing discovery, one which marked my life more deeply than any book of literature, and it was a parasitological treatise with a dirty, worn cover, like all my notebooks had at that time, like my high school uniform that seemed made of blotter paper soaked in faded ink. It could be the biography of a louse or a mite, but it would still be just as important as my own skin, because I am that obscure creature. The tunnels where I swarm are my own. The excrements, mine. The sensations, mine. The turpitude, all mine. He even brings in Proust when he says that The Gadfly, that book by Voynich that he read, which Voynich is also connected to Charles Hinton, by the way, he says that The Gadfly would become my Madeline. And this, among many other reasons, is why I say that Cartorescu has basically extended the epic of nostalgia and memory from Proust and brought it into the 21st century. So he's just mentioned the gadfly as his Madeline. So we know he's got Proust in mind. And now in this paragraph, and especially with the way it ends, we get the same thoughts that Proust expressed in his essay on reading and about days of reading. 
I was reading a newer edition of The Gadfly, of course, than the one I had held in my hands 12 years before. Perhaps that's why I didn't recognize it as the true book. It didn't smell like bad paper, porous, yellowed, rotting. The glue wasn't made from bones, and minuscule paper scorpions, pale and tailless, weren't consuming the paper, appearing sometimes along the spine. While I read, almost without seeing the letters, the color of the sheets didn't match the twilight precisely, like it had before. This is already just conveying the strength of the sensory experience of reading a physical book, especially an old one, or one that we've read many times throughout our life. The first book had been a portal to my internal cistern of tears, while the second just a door drawn on a wall. The first had been anonymous and titleless, and it lacked the first chapters, the way any book ought to begin and be read by an honest, non-discriminating mind and eyes, open as they would never be again. He is, it's almost like Jesus saying to us to have the faith of children. He's saying, and as I agree, we need to read like children read, eager, hungry. Perhaps all we want from reading is to return to that age when we could hold a book and cry, to that time between childhood and adolescence, the sweetest era of our lives. And as Proust had it, books are the only calendars we have of the days we have lost. He makes some big, serious, bold, audacious assertions about books, literature, reading. A book should demand an answer. If it doesn't, if your gaze ends on its ingenious, inventive, tender, wise, joyful, and wonderful surface instead of pointing you in the direction this book shows, then you have read a literary work, and you have missed, once again, the meaning of any human effort to escape from this world. No book has any meaning if it is not a gospel. A prisoner on death row could have his cell lined with bookshelves, all wonderful books, but what he actually needs is an escape plan. And I'll extend on that, because that's the serialized metaphor throughout the book later. I have read thousands of books, but never found one that was a landscape as opposed to a map. Every page of theirs is flat, but life itself is not. Why would I, a three-dimensional creature, take as a guide the two dimensions of an ordinary text? Where will I find the cubical page where reality is modeled? Where is the hypercubic book whose covers gather the hundreds of cubes of its passages? Only then, through the tunnel of cubes, can we escape from the suffocating cell, or at least breathe the air of another world. If I could breathe the clouds and streets and trams, the trees and women, like the pure air of a much denser world. And on that score, I believe that the only other 21st century novel I've read that has this same aspiration at perhaps this same level of passion would be Philip Friedenberg's work. So Phil, can't wait for that next one. I don't believe in books. I believe in pages, in phrases, in lines. I think I'm going to adopt that as my new mantra. I love that, and that's so, that rings so intimately true for me. I don't believe in books. I believe in pages, in phrases, in lines. There are some, in some books, like in the coded text a general receives on the battlefield. Only some of the words mean anything, surrounded by meaningless blather. That's why people used books to say important things, because a book assumes an absence on one side or the other. While it is being written, the reader is missing. While it is being read, the writer is missing. That is, we have the space to have, I believe, a much deeper and more meaningful conversation. Okay, here we go. Here's just another one of the multitude of places where Murcia's powers of poetic rendering are operating in that sublime mode. The Old Testament, the book to end all books, the book which, after the hundreds and thousands of texts I had read up until then with great pleasure, poems, novels, stories, essays, and literary studies, showed me and everyone else that it was possible to speak the truth, 
to lay the truth out over pages as thin as the discarded skin of vipers. That little book with thousands of transparent pages, with its twin columns of tiny type, with its numbers and footnotes, with the maps of Judea at the end, seemed as valuable to me as the tablets of Moses, where, it was said, the writing was not carved, but floated one finger width above the stone's polished surface, written by the finger of God, floating in the air, glittering a holographic blue, casting a gentle light just like the face of the prophet who, on the mountain, neither ate nor slept for forty days. That's what literature must be in order to mean anything. An act of levitation over the page. A pneumatic text without any point of contact with the material world. So even if in the end, in our most rational mind and sober expectations of this world, even if we conclude that Mercia in ultimately what we have as solenoid, does not succeed with such an aspiration. We can't help but be grateful for the expression that Cartorescu is able to manage for this burning, ineffable, seemingly ineffable feeling within our hearts. Like Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, God has placed an enigma in some translations or eternity in others in our hearts yet we still can't know the end from the beginning. In other words, we're pre-made or we're conceived with a built-in desire or longing for eternity, yet we constantly chafe against the walls of the impossibility of doing such. Here is a sublime passage about reading. I read, in the green swing, that first page from a large white book, and I was left unable to believe, not that someone could write it, but that I was capable of receiving it. I could say this about Solenoid, that I was able to transpose it from another mind's logic into the logic of my own, to dress the fine symmetrical joints of the supple boned skeleton of the text with the incarnation of my own life, of my own memories. Who constructed that Memphis that Nile charged with the reflections of the stars, those megalithic and bizarre places. A long dead person had grafted a slice of his brain onto mine. Whew. That's what's happening to us. That's one way of understanding and conceiving what's happening to us when we read the greatest books is that a long dead person is grafting a slice of their brain onto ours. What a thought. In this passage, this pegs the way that I go about choosing my next books to read. I never chose books by their author, cover, or even their titles. I would choose them for a certain quality that, using the wrong word but lacking an adequate one, I would call their tactility. Simply the touch of my fingertips to the spine of the book. Some books burned. Others seemed frozen to me. But these are metaphors. Something would click, like coins to a magnet. I felt I could tell in a flash if the book was for me. I felt, without error, the books that would make me happy or unhappy. And even if I didn't actually read some at the time, I was still right, because they became my favorites later. All right, welcome to the highlight reel portion of this video. This is where I'm just gonna go through and read out loud the passages that I felt were absolute highlights of this enigmatic prose. And I'll offer some brief commentary here and there. If you've read the book, I hope that you'll enjoy sharing these excerpts with me. I feel certain that you probably also savored them. If you haven't read the book, there are no spoilers. And my hope is that this highlight reel will compel you either to buy the book and read it or take the book down from your shelf and read it. With every move we make in our lives, we make a choice or we are blown by a breath of wind down one aisle or another. The line of our life only solidifies behind us. It becomes coherent as it fossilizes into the simplicity 
of destiny, while the lives that could have been, that could have diverged moment by moment from the life that triumphed are dotted ghostly lines, creodes, quantum differences, translucid and fascinating like stems vegetating in the greenhouse. If I blink, my life forks. I could have not blinked, and then I would have been a far different person from the one who did, like streets that radiate out from a narrow piata. In the end, I will be wrapped in a cocoon made of the transparent threads of millions of virtual lives, of billions of paths I could have taken, each infinitesimally changing the angle of approach. After an adventure lasting as long as my life, I will meet them again, the millions of my other selves, the possible, the probable, the happenstance, and the necessary, all at the end of their stories. We will tell each other about our successes and failures, our adventures and boredoms, our glory and shame. So Contra Milan Kundera in The Unbearable Lightness of Being, he maintains that we have only one life, so we can't really try out different ones and see which one is the best and then use that as our course to go. But according to Merchant Carter Rescue or Mercha, here in Solenoid, we are constantly branching off. So it's sort of like a multiverse idea of every possible route that our life could take, every possible decision is actually something that does branch off and has its own reality. But Cartorescu takes it to the next level and says that we will all, all of ourselves, all of our instantiation of different lives that branched off will ultimately meet up when they're at the end and all of ourselves can discuss their own journeys with one another. What a, what a thought. Something similar happens in Blake Crouch's Dark Matter. And by the way, the Tesseract is the idea of the Tesseract as a vessel for transporting us to a higher dimension and the idea of being able to communicate back with ourselves in the lower dimension is, I've said this over and over, but at the end of uh, Interstellar, Christopher Nolan, what an imagination, what a visual treat. If nothing human is foreign to me, by definition, I will embrace through my real-virtual brothers all possibilities and fulfill all the virtualities meshed in the joints of my body and mind. Some will be so different from me they will cross the barrier of sex, the imperatives of ethics, the gestalt of the body, becoming sub- or superhumans or alternative humans. Others will only differ from me in unobservable details, a single molecule of ACTH that his striated body released while your striated body did not, a single extra K cell in your blood, an odd glint in the eye, an art that followed the rules, the centuries-old canons, a successful kind of music, of course, but a human one. And just this humanity was the coin that passed everywhere, in palaces and hovels alike, because the weight of the coin feels so nice in the palm of your hand. But inhuman, disordered art that didn't follow even the construction of the human ear, nor the construction of the violin, that knew not the limits of fingers on the strings, art from another world that magically penetrated Ephemoth's body, that art presses against your hand like the icy blade of a razor. It slices down your lifeline, leaving you scarred forever. And aside from just being an astonishing bit of imagery, it also recalls Kafka's often quoted aphorism that we ought to only read the books that wound us. After you've read tens of thousands of books, you can't help but ask yourself, while I was doing that, where did my life go? You've gulped down the lives of others, which always lack a dimension in comparison to the world in which you exist, however amazing their tours of artistic force might be. You have seen colors of others and felt the bitterness and sweetness and potential and exasperation of others' consciousnesses, to the point that they have eclipsed your own sensations and pushed them into the shadows. If only you could pass into the tactile space of beings other than you. But again and again, you were only 
rolled between the fingertips of literature. <laughs> Unceasingly, in a thousand voices, it promised you escape, while it robbed you of even the frozen crust of reality that you once had. Mircea presents a question that comes up in the mind of the bookworm. I have spent so much of my life, so many hours of my life, immersed in literature. Is this a good thing? Is it healthy? Have I been pushing out reality? And for me, I think that almost anything in excess is a danger and has the potential to have the opposite effect of the goodness that's intended. And so it's sobering to read passages like this because it reminds me of how important that balance is between your reading life and your personal life here in this reality. Still, what a figuration to say that <laughs> the reader is yearning to inhabit these worlds. And what really happened was that again and again, you were only rolled between the fingertips of literature. Each book was a slot where I could look into another person's skull. I added that to my list of aphorisms about books and reading. This is what my life is like, how it has always seemed. The singular, uniform, and tangible world on one side of the coin, and the secret, private, phantasmagoric world of my mind's dreams on the other. Neither is complete and true without the other. And it made me think of the C.S. Lewis quote that I used in my second episode of the Why We Read Fiction series, where he talks about how the enchanted woods don't replace all other real woods. They make all other real woods a little more enchanted. So when we read, in a sense, we are sharpening both sides of that coin. The eyes of the two-headed Janus are both getting clarified. Like horror beyond horror, the greatest horror, the mother of all our fears, the fear of an eternity in which you no longer exist. And this stopped me in my tracks. And I really thought about our different fears and about especially the fear of dying. And I think it's true that ultimately our greatest fear is to imagine an eternity in which we don't exist. It's unthinkable to think about the world going on without us in it. Today it feels as though I had been a girl in a previous life, as though the girl left a hole shaped like her body in the petrified ash of my mind, like those left by the people incinerated at Pompeii. This is a great example of how he takes an already poetic image and then intensifies it even further. After an eternity, I was allowed to breathe again, and the doctor ratcheted back the plates where I had been pressed. I felt so free that I could almost fly, because breath is nothing more than the beating of our wings through the godly azure of life. There's a great aphorism for what breathing is. All right, so here's that extended metaphor that I've been talking about that's serialized throughout the book. On page 211, it says, No book has any meaning if it is not a gospel. A prisoner on death row could have his cell lined with bookshelves, all wonderful books, but what he actually needs is an escape plan. It continues on page 353. Nothing would be easier than to help a prisoner escape if you have, in comparison to him, an extra dimension. You simply take him between your fingers and lift him up, perpendicular to his world, into a space he cannot imagine. Those around him will only see him miraculously disappear. His footsteps in the snow will stop suddenly in the middle of the front yard. And that is alluding back to the scene in the book The Gadfly that rocked him as a kid. And then on the next page, 354, if we could grasp an extra dimension, if we could imagine other directions beside left and right, forward and back, up and down, we would realize that no one can hold us in the prison of our world, that one of its giant walls is unoccupied, unwalled, because the jailers are betting we will stay blind to the open door. This is just profound. It's not unlike in the scene between Lyle and Lamont Chu in Infinite Jest, 
Lyle says that the first step in exiting the cage that Lyle, uh, that Lamont is trapped in, that is his quest for fame, his yearning for fame, the first step is recognizing that there is a cage. The almost maniacal passion with which he speaks about the only topic that interests him, mathematics. This is Mercia talking about a fellow teacher who's a mathematics teacher. As a child, he made friends with numbers, not other children. Every number had a shape, taste, smell, texture, and personality. Every one matched with others according to subterranean affinities that Goya did not know how to explain to me, but which I felt clearly the way you feel air pressure or gravity. Later, he became friends with mathematicians. He knew each of their lives in detail. The history of mathematics flowed out of him easily with its tens of thousands of influences, interrelations, ideas forgotten for centuries and rediscovered, errors and revelations, impasses and orgasmic releases with a grandeur equal to nothing except the birth of the universe or the evolution of species. And I couldn't help but think about McCarthy's Alicia Western when I read this. This is how we are born through our personal maze, defoliating moment by moment into thousands and thousands of kagamushas, which is Japanese for shadow warriors. Most of them almost identical to us, while others are strange, even monstrous, but their sum is me, the sum of their virtual lives. Two hands are always needed to write a text that isn't just for fun, consolation, or self hypnosis. One writes hunched over the manuscript, shadowing and dominating it with his authority. The other, the tenebrous, widowed, disconsolate, anonymous person found within the manuscript, below the page that the first one writes, fills it from underneath with his own signs. He scatters images throughout, curled up under the platform like Michelangelo on his high wooden scaffold the paint dripping into his eyes and on his face, depicting strange characters on the chapel's interior. At night, sometimes, when I don't have anything else to think about, I mentally stretch my flayed skin like a map across the wall next to my bed, and I look at the moles scattered up and down, imagining they are letters in an odd code. What could be written on my skin, I wonder? Have you ever imagined such a thing? How does someone's mind get to this level where they're imagining their skin being wrapped in a code constructed of their moles. And they sit and picture their skin flayed and nailed to their wall and trying to wonder how to decrypt the message. I've never had such a thought. When he's talking about the glory of the fame he could have had, had his life taken the path of a successful, famous, popular writer. He says, could he have levitated if his pockets were loaded with glory? There's a literal and a figurative meaning here. The literal one is that the Murcia character is levitating above his bed because of the solenoid, and he wouldn't have ended up in that house and in that condition had he taken the road to fame. But the figurative is that the very fame would weigh the writer down and thus prevent the writer from the glory that could be. But the way that that is just expressed here and in some of his more terse prose in one sentence, could he have levitated if his pockets were loaded with glory? I remember when I was at St. Kitts the week after finishing this book, and we started talking about the feeling of deja vu at dinner one night. And I was like, oh, 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 I just read probably the best description of what deja vu is like, but I didn't have the book with me, and I had to wait until I got back home, and somehow I actually remembered to go and take a picture of this page and send it to him. But this is incredible, and what's happening here is He's describing what's going on as he is looking at his childhood home. It was like it was and also not like it was, the house. It felt like deja vu in which not the image, but the emotion floods over you, overwhelms you. It was like an afternoon daydream or a dream at night, 
a dream with houses taking shape in the intense magic of recognition. Yes, that's how it was. Yes, I was there, you say to yourself, frozen in your suffering and nostalgia, looking at the edifice sculpted from the substance of your cerebellum, bathed in the storms of your endorphins. How, how does someone get to the level where they can write like this? I am so grateful that I'm able to read books like these. But, you know, it's not all complex, extended, excessive pyrotechnics. Sometimes it's something as simple as this. The snow was falling against the ground in whispers. A stale olive air, like a museum. An active, tense quiet foretelling something that had probably never taken place. I understood better than anyone why Virgil and Kafka wanted to turn their masterpieces into ash. Both writers wanted their works burned and destroyed. Because silence and ash are straight paths, while music and books set free in the world are divagations. Ash is the final fate, in any case, of all writing. And because of that, I will not suffer when my manuscript meets the fire. It is not a book, even less so a novel. It is an escape plan. And after escape, its natural destiny is ash. So again, this is where we get the final resolve of that serialized metaphor and the need for an escape plan to actually escape prison and for any great literature to be that escape from life. And thus, in Cartarescu's conception in Solenoid, that is going to be to construct a tesseract, a fourth dimension tesseract out of words. Ultimately, though, there comes a moment when each of us must decide to rescue either the work of art or the child from the burning building. It was the mystery of the space between synapses. It was the drop of serotonin that crosses the minuscule gap like an angel or a messenger. In conclusion, we all have hopes and dreams. And now my only dream is that I get to read the body and the right wing of the Blinding Trilogy, translated by Sean Cotter in my lifetime. But nonetheless, if I have to live the rest of my life with only Cotter's translation of the left wing of Blinding and now Solenoid, I can die a happy bookworm.